Your life, for better or worse, consists of the decisions you make, both large and small. Moving to a different country or simply moving out of your parents' house, breaking up with a partner or asking out your crush. Even small things, like picking up a book out of boredom or taking one class, could entirely change your life. And this could be for the better or the worst. You could regret breaking up with that partner. The country you move to might become war-torn. These decisions, no matter how well thought out, are played out in a world that offers us no guarantees. And we know this. That's why, for the most part, making decisions can be so stressful. What are we to do with the time we have here? One useful way to explore this is by comparing the thoughts of two different ancient Chinese philosophers, who both recognize the capricious nature of the world. Mozart, a carpenter and of fairly low social status, emerged as a prominent thinker, who would advise several powerful leaders in China. Mozart preached a philosophy of love and introspection, and rejected the idea that rituals were of any use. In fact, Mozart believed that society was not suited for human flourishing. Instead, society should encourage people towards believing that the world is made up of a clear sense of right and wrong. This does not mean that he actually believed that the world was coherent or predictable, but rather that we should construct a society that sincerely believes it to be coherent. Mencius, a disciple of the famous Confucius, agreed with much of what Mozi had to say. He also agreed that the world was largely unpredictable. However, he also feared that Mozi's world of reward and punishment could train everyone into making decisions based purely on self-interest. It would be a society of profit-driven, selfish individuals. Rather than artificially constructing a world of right and wrong, Mencius instead advocated for people to understand and accept that the world is in a state of perpetual disorder. But how? This video is sponsored by Brilliant. While the world can be pretty unpredictable, that doesn't mean we should completely give up on making any decisions at all. In fact, there's a whole science behind trying our best to predict the best next move from interpreting patterns and data. It's called probability. But isn't that hard to learn? I thought so too, until I found Brilliant, a fun and interactive way to learn topics that I usually would find to be way too complex. Brilliant's new introduction to probability course is perfect for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis. The course covers everything from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regressions, and lets you gain insight by providing real data sets from real-life companies. If your curiosity goes beyond statistics and probability, Brilliant has over 60 other courses with clear and intuitive explanations that can tell you how STEM actually works and how it's relevant in your everyday life. No matter what your level of knowledge, the step-by-step -step solutions and fun problem-solving exercises ensure that you'll be able to master all sorts of technical subjects, from neural networks to astronomy. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash sisyphus55. Everyone who clicks the link will also get 20% off their premium annual subscription. Mencius' solution seems pretty difficult if we are to assume that we often make choices based on logic and reasoning. We need some idea of coherence, predictability, and reasoning in order to rationally come to a conclusion over the decisions we make. We cannot simply rely on our gut instinct or vibes to navigate the world, right? However, according to the somatic marker hypothesis proposed by Antonio Damasio, we've never really been that rational to begin with. While philosophers such as René Descartes proposed that the mind and body are separate, and subsequently that reasoning guides our emotions and choices, Damasio points to a wide range of studies that demonstrate the crucial role that emotions play in making decisions. One example is the case study of Elliot, a patient who suffered from frontal lobe damage. The frontal lobe is an area in the brain that is largely involved in emotional processing, and under Descartes' argument, disruption to this area shouldn't result in changes in reasoning. However, as demonstrated, Elliot could reason, but the decisions he made were usually against his very well-being. Elliot and other frontally damaged patients were still sensitive to punishment. Although the effects of punishment did not seem to last for very long, probably because it was not connected with the formulation of predictors concerning future prospects. 
These predictors were, in simple terms, Eliot's emotions. Damasio uses this, among other examples, to show that, rather than obstacles, emotions are crucial in making rational decisions. Okay, so maybe we can't be rational machines. Does this mean we should go with our gut? Not necessarily. These emotions are still pretty wild and can lead us to impulsively deciding whatever we would like to do at the moment. However, as Mencius argued, these emotions could be cultivated for better decision making. Importantly, Mencius believed that all individuals have the potential for goodness. In the same way that water tends to flow downwards, we tend towards goodness. And to unlock this goodness requires little effort. For example, we might see a child who has fallen into a river and without thinking try to save them. Mencius believes that this impulse is natural and universal. However, just like how a dam can keep water from flowing downward, so too can society obstruct us from reaching this potential for goodness. This is demonstrated in how we tend to make plans based on who we think we are. How we view ourselves may be a set of patterns we have fallen into, patterns that society has told us. To make decisions based on this is to risk limiting ourselves. You eliminate your ability to grow as a person because you are limiting that growth to what is in the best interests of the person you happen to be right now, and not the person you will become. Do we really know what is good for us, let alone who we truly are? That is why cultivating a third approach, the heart-mind, is crucial. The heart-mind harnesses both our emotions and rationality. It deliberates just as much as it loves. The drowning child is a good example of the heart-mind in action. The cognitive ability to observe and act on the child's situation, as well as the emotion needed to motivate one to actually save the child, equips our rational and emotional capacities. This is the tool of flexible judgment, our ability to make good decisions instinctively while rationally weighing each situation on a case-by-case -case basis. We will need this sort of judgment if we ever wish to tackle far more ambiguous problems than drowning children. To cultivate the heart-mind requires a deliberate and patient study of one's emotions and desires, to understand ourselves better and approach situations with open minds. That means accepting certain principles, such as the possibility that we don't entirely know ourselves and that the world is largely unpredictable. Nothing is guaranteed. This is Ming, the unpredictability of life. Our lives will involve endless uncertainty and confusion twists and turns. However, as Mencius argues, it should never be anyone's fate to die in shackles. In other words, we should never fail to respond appropriately to what befalls us. We should expect to be surprised, and the most we can ever really do is harness our heart-mind to better handle these surprises. Because sometimes these surprises can be good. Holding on too tightly might lead you to missing out. In short, the right decision is the one that makes sense both emotionally and rationally. It feels good regardless of the outcome. It speaks to that inner potential for goodness. But to understand what is good takes a lot of work. It takes years of mistakes and seemingly wrong turns. It takes existential crises and late-night heart-to-hearts. Some might even call it the simple process of growing up. Whatever the case, be patient, listen close, and never be too hard on yourself. Nobody really knows what they're doing anyways. Nothing else for time.